Happy Mail Eye, and we're celebrating our 19th edition, and we are mm -hmm. in the virtual space 100% this year. Hopefully not uh, in the late spring, we'll be able to move into some outdoor screenings and possibly deliver some other events, but I'm really excited that you're all here, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us from all over the world. So I'm going to do a brief introduction. We have uh, Therese Fra Helliger, the Invisible Father. Um, we have uh, Caroline Daunt, uh, Beyond the Clouds. Megan Jones, Six Angry Women. And we have Catherine Legault, Sisters Dream and, um, I'm sorry, Sisters Dream and Variations and Melissa Godot, Determined. These are all wonderful documentaries, and if you haven't had an opportunity to see them, I encourage you to do so. Um, check out our website. Some of them are on Encore. Other films, like Caroline's, is having its premiere at TIFF Bell Lightbox, as well, um, be, uh, Beyond the Clouds, and I do believe the rest are currently undetermined. I'm sorry, Melissa Godot, you're also on TIFF. Uh, March the 26th to the 28th. So let's start our panel. I'm curious to know always, especially with documentarians, um, I'm going to put this question to each one of you, and that is, um, what inspired you to, to make this film? What was the inspiration for your documentary? And I'll start with uh, Therese. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Therese Hellicher, my film is The Invisible Father. And my film is a journey to get to know my father, Piero Hellicher, who was a beat poet and experimental filmmaker. So I explore his life and legacy. And he's someone that I didn't know. I, I grew up without a father. So it was both um, my own personal desire to get to know him, but also raising a daughter I started to see her relationship with her father and started to understand maybe what I had been missing. It had not been something that I had been interested in exploring until I became a parent myself. So that was um, really the, the, the initial thought was, oh, maybe, maybe I am missing something by um, not learning more about my father or understanding who he was. And that was really kind of the, the kernel that, that started my, my journey. And when did that journey, when did that journey start, Therese? That's a good question. It, it started sort of around 2006, 2007. Um, Jonas Mikas was celebrating his 90th birthday. Some of you may know the, the filmmaker Jonas Mikas. And he was a um, huge supporter of my father's and they, you know, were contemporaries and worked together a lot in the in the 60s in New York. And Jonas was showing some of the ephemera and letters and publications that he had from my father over the years. My father would send out, you know, his film flyers or poetry flyers and, and Jonas as a great um, collector, a filmmaker himself, but also really someone who who keeps that kind of work with anthology film archives in New York. It's all about you know preservation of the films and and these legacies. And so, thanks to Jonas, we had an exhibition in New York of some of my father's work. And so that was like, I wasn't I wasn't ready. You know, I had been thinking about this, but that event was happening and I knew if I was gonna make a documentary, I would have to film that. And some of my family in Europe was coming to that exhibition. And so it was kind of the beginning inciting incident where it was, I have, I have to capture this footage. I have to get a camera crew and, and go to the exhibition and interview my family members, interview Jonas, interview the gallery owner. And so that was really the beginning of the journey. Thank you. Caroline, you knew uh, Marion Hansel um, for some time, uh, but what, how did you, how, what was your, um, the moment when you said, I'm going to make a documentary about Marion Hansel? Oh, well, I don't really 
know how to answer your question. Um, what inspired me with Marion, maybe it, it's, I can answer in, in two period of time. The first one was, uh, I remember going in, in the cinema and discovering a movie she made. At that time, I didn't know her, just by name. And uh, telling myself, well, it's possible to be a woman and to make films like this, so international movies. And it was in itself inspiring. And then I met Marion, I worked with her, and I discovered all her cine cinematography and knowing her um, the energy she has. And um, in itself, it was inspiring to make a documentary. So I begin to, to yes, to, uh, to think about it. And it was the, the beginning of that. May I ask you something? Did you know we lost Marion Hansel in 220, which is tragic. Um, did you know, did, did you know she was unwell when you were making the documentary? Oh, her health was fragile because she has some troubles in the past, but mm -hmm. by then she was well. And well, it's like, yeah. it's a beautiful documentary. Thank you. And a great homage to Marion Hansel. Thank you. I'm going to let Megan get settled and I'm going to move <laughs> over. Oh, there you are. All right. You're here. You're back. Oh, she's gone. Catherine Legault, Sisters, Dream, and Variations. I'm going to ask you the same question. What inspired you to make this documentary? Well, I used to play cello. I played for about 10 years. And uh, Tier Jamie, which is a, a musician and singer, was uh, my cello teacher at the time. So that's how we met in the first place. And uh, she was collaborating uh, with her sister on different art projects. Her sister is an interdisciplinary artist. And they were collaborating on the Singya, their music project. And I witnessed that. So first, it was really like the... Uh, I was inspired by their style and their artistic um, projects, but then I discovered that the, uh, they were actually using their great-grandmother's uh, Icelandic folk song recordings on cassette tapes, and, um, and all of this uh, Icelandic heritage was very uh, fascinating and interesting to me. So it uh, just sparked the idea to make a film about them, you know, their collaboration, but also their family history. So it's really uh, like it's a blend of documentary, but it also has performances and animation. And um, it's it's a way to explore, like to show art and see how it can uh, explore who we are um, as we're creating. So and then I met with their parents as well. So it really opened up like another layer uh, in the story, and then uh, they went to Iceland for the very first time, um, visiting their that country. So that was very uh, revealing in many ways. And such beautiful footage, and the animation in your film is extraordinary. Really, it's a lovely touch, no, especially with the, the grandmother. It's very beautiful. It was a way to give life to the great grandmother, which yes. uh, passed away, I think, 30 years ago. But so I had access to an incredible amount of archives, photographs dating from 1917, and also like uh, uh, 16 millimeter reels and uh, VHS tapes and hi eights, and I uh, I digitized everything and based the animation on the um, the documentary elements I had. So you were able to digitize all the analog material, I would imagine, yes, yes? because they were literally cassette tapes uh, yes. that she recorded her songs on. Unbelievable that they survived the, the test of time. I know. And, and then the translations just like unfolded, you know, mm -hmm. so many new poetry and images to work with. May new I ask, how many, how many hours of, of analog material did you did you digitize 
um, probably a, around like 50 hours, just like of archives mm -hmm. and like hundreds of photographs. And then I did some research as well to uh, uh, the library, National Library, um, to get some like original, uh, like the um, passengers list is actually the original uh, signature from the great grandmother from 1924 when she actually immigrated to Canada um, mm -hmm. on this big boat. And uh, I got also one of the boats that was original to the time. So it was uh, important for me to, even with like all of the fantasy and the playfulness of the movie, mm -hmm. uh, to get this uh, uh, documentary, uh, like the get the real uh, elements from the time. Just really, truly beautiful. Um, thank you so much for that. Thank Melissa you. Godoy. Godoy. Let's talk about determined. Very different. All of you have such very different documentaries. So it's just, I can't tell you, it's such a treat having you all on the panel. So let's talk about determined. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. So what inspired me? That is so interesting. Okay, I had finished another documentary in 2006 called Do Not Go Gently about creative aging. So it was all about what happens to our minds as we get older creatively. And in the process, I just you know found out that there's this whole population of people with Alzheimer's disease who benefit from creative activity. And I got very interested in that. And actually, I Co I directed it and co-produced it with my mother, who is also a co-producer on this film. But anyway, so then from 2007 to 2013, I actually began to work creatively with people in a um, dementia-friendly daycare for people with Alzheimer's disease. So I was working on filmmaking with them. I found that that was an art form that hadn't really been, you know, used much with people with Alzheimer's disease. So we were making fiction films, and I felt very comfortable with the, this population. I felt like these were my people, and. 2013, right after finishing a short film, uh, the person who really inspired the documentary, Therese Barry Tanner, the producer, approached me with a concept. Did she happen to be in a human research study, a longitudinal human research study for people who are at high risk for Alzheimer's disease? She's also a documentary aficionado. And one day after her mother died of Alzheimer's disease, thought, wouldn't this make a great documentary? What, what it's like to be in a study. So we talked on the phone and, you know, I thought it was such a great idea. It's such an interesting angle. Number one, working with her has been amazing because she has all her skin in the game. She is in the study. So she is exactly like the protagonists. And she watched every documentary about Alzheimer's disease she could find to see if this was an, an angle you know, that was unique. And indeed it was. And I thought to me, I wanted to try and approach a sort of observational approach of storytelling to just follow some of these human research subjects. That's kind of a very scientific word for the participants in the study and see how their lives evolve over time. And then, you know, the work of science. So it was really kind of a complicated concept, but it was the artistic inspiration. But also I felt like this was a, an idea that could change lives. I felt that in the end we could maybe make a difference in the world somehow. And we had, we had no idea going into what, what was gonna happen. And actually, so we followed these people who are in this medical study. And of course, we just sort of dropped into the middle of a study that's been going on for over 20 years. We couldn't show the beginning and we certainly can't show the end. We can just show like a little piece of it and hope that there would be something that will come out of it that would inspire, activate people and uh, make a difference. Thank you. Certainly enlightening. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. Um, Megan Jones. Six angry women. So let's talk about six angry women. I think I need to. Um, I think you are muted, my dear. Hello. Hello. Apologize for earlier. I've got a surly teenage boy who has to bike to school and he's not happy. <laughs> He's also got a flat tire. Oh. So um, my story is about um, something that my family has talked about for years. My mother was um, involved in an incident in the 1980s where her drama lecturer was kidnapped by a group of women who chained him to a tree and beat him up and accused him of being a rapist. 
and um, they were never found and he was never charged. So it was these two unsolved mysteries. So we've talked about this over the years and it was only really two years ago when I was sitting talking about stories with a friend of mine and, and talking about doing something about feminist issues and I went, oh, my God, no one's ever really covered this story and I've got this access to it. So um, started reinvestigating both sides of the story, whether he was guilty and also who might have done it to him. And it evolved into Six Angry Women, which I is... I suspect <clears throat> that you know who those women are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have you. my suspicions and I, I feel satisfied by the end. But, you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of cool that... Um, We'll never really know the truth for sure. And I think that's what's fascinating about the story, really. It's it's morally is, complex and is, is intriguing. The accused, is the accused man still alive? Does he live in New Zealand still? Is no, he, he died quite young, not long after this happened. It, it ruined his life. So it's, oh, um, no, it's an interesting story because it resonates in today's call-out culture and makes a lot of Me Too activists look like pussycats. And yeah. wow. <laughs> It's Did sort of unbelievable his... that it happened, really, because New Zealand has forgotten about it, and it was such an exceptional event. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody yeah. was talking about it. I mean, the police and, I mean, it was a really big deal. It was quite radical for its time, and we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I am curious, to, I was curious to know if he was still alive and he was never charged. May I ask a morbid question? Did he take his own life? No, he didn't. He okay. he got cancer. He he protested his innocence till his death, but his career was destroyed. You know, he was he was broken. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. It's yeah. Incredible. And it wasn't he was never even charged with anything. So there are a lot of people in New Zealand who feel very, very strongly that he was um unjustly accused because he was he regarded himself as a feminist. He thought he was a socialist activist. He thought he was pretty right on. He <laughs> He, um, I mean, there's probably a lot of men like that, but yeah. Do you think it was one of the six angry women that who who that one of the six angry women were the victim of this rape? Well, no. Um, there is a woman in the movie because no one ever came forward and accused him publicly of rape at the time. But there was a woman in the film who comes forward after all these years and tells us her account of what happened to her which is rape and um but she never wanted to prosecute him because the rape processes as they are today are horrific to victims so that was what the whole action was about i don't think the six women particularly cared whether they had any proof of his guilt there is a rumor that the woman who called rape in the movie was the sister of one of them but um we could never get to the bottom of that. And they were just fed up. They were fed up with what was going on for women at the time. There was a huge amount of um, really horrific sex crimes going on in the country. And, mm -hmm. and they were also bringing to light for the first time the whole issue of sexual harassment at Auckland University where he was teaching. I don't think that was even a term that we used in the 80s. It was just kind of coming to the fore. And... Um, so they didn't really care. He was the guy they chose to make an example of. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, we'll, I, we'll, we'll speak a little bit. I have a question for you specifically about New Zealand and, and domestic laws um, in regards to violence against women. And I mean, it wasn't that long ago that uh, spousal rape wasn't even a, there was no such thing as spousal rape. I mean, if you were married to a man, the man could rape you or take you unwillingly and and there, it yep. wasn't a criminal offense so 1984 gonna... he could he could even share you with his friends oh geez 1984 that's not that long ago it's quite horrific mm. actually um mm. but very well done it had a, it was in flat you know for a very serious topic there was uh, a wonderful um inflection or infusion of humor in your documentary <laughs> just by virtue of the women, the characters, which I thought was just so extraordinary. It added brevity um, mm. in such a interesting and subtle way. Um, 
but it it's there. So congratulations again on um, Six Angry Women. And Thank if you, you want, at some point while we're live, you can still type the title of your film beside your name if you like. Oh, I can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, feel free to do that. All right, let's bounce around a little bit. So, uh, Caroline, I wanted to ask you, I have a, a very specific question for you, and so I'm going to ask it, and that is, you know, in the making of a documentary, there's moments, you know, that are just so impactful and important. And I was just wondering if you had one or more very memorable, one of the greatest impressions that you had in the making of the documentary with Marion Hansel. Was there something that really resonated with you that was so important and so memorable? Oh, yes, I can, I can tell the story. For the, for the film, we had the chance to go to, to Djibouti, where Marion uh, shot one of her films. And uh, in her film, there were at that time three children. My goal was to find them, to um, have the chance to make sequences with them. Uh, very rapidly, we knew that uh, the girl was no longer living there, though, so it was not possible. One of them was there, uh, and so we rapidly uh, had the chance to contact him. And the youngest one uh, was living in a remote area of the country. But at the moment he knew that Marion was there, he, he, he made two days to, to join us. And it was off camera because it was at, nine, at night. And for me, it was a very moving moment because I so Marion take this young huddle uh, in, in, his, in her arm and as she would have done when he was a child. And then he was uh, telling me that it, it was so important, the experience of having Marion in, in, in his life. Uh, and when when he was shooting the movie, she was very, uh, very uh, aware of the fact that they were children and it was special for them. And during the, she was very careful during the, the day, but also during the night, she, she, she go with them and tell them stories uh, before sleeping. And knowing that, when she wow. was there as a producer, also as a director in a country where everything can happen because Djibouti is not like as if you are shooting in Brussels. It's not so easy. Yeah. So um, for me, it was very impressive. And it's, I, I wanted to tell this because um, it was her taking care of everyone. So the crew, also the actor, but everyone. She, she, she has this thing to, to take care of everyone. Nurturing. She was very nurturing. Are, you, are we speaking about the film that was shot in the sand with the family and the little girl who is... The wind lift. The yes, sand. yes. Phenomenal film. Spectacular. And in that film, you really see her love of sky, of nature. Yeah. She speaks to that, 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 yeah, that yeah. the most beautiful cinematography in the world, the most cinegra uh, cinemographic um, uh, beauty is in nature and the sky. It's just so vast and so magnificent and very, a lot of children in that film. Yeah, that was, that was the purpose. So, because in, in, in others movies, there, there's, there is children too. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Therese, I kind of, you touched on it already um, when I asked you about the, the inciting moment or the moment where you decided to, to make a documentary about your father. Um, 
and it was in the actual when that you knew there was going to be an exhibition and there was going to be all of this work. So your first uh, foray into the documentary in terms of filmmaking was actually at that event in the exhibition? Well, Caroline actually just reminded me of something. So um, I, I can talk about that, but I also, if if you don't mind, since I already answered that question, Caroline reminded me of something that was very um, monumental in my film and in my process, and and it was also off camera. So oh, I, can, I can I can kind of combine those those yes. two stories. So so the exhibition was the first time that I actually hired a camera crew. Prior to the exhibition, I was doing a little bit of um, filming myself. Uh, I was starting to take documentary film classes. I was connecting with other filmmakers. I live in Seattle, Washington. We have a very supportive independent film community here. So I was very lucky to be in a place where I could network and talk to other filmmakers and get ideas and experience. And so to a certain extent, I frankly just kind of started shooting. And one of the interviews that I shot myself, which, which is in the film, the quality, you know, is not as good as, you know, once I started hiring professionals, but it was with um, Jean-Claude von Italy, who is a playwright, an American playwright, and he went to Harvard with my father. That's how they met. And then they continued, you know, their relationship. And meeting, meeting with Jean-Claude was sort of like the big hug that I needed from my father. Like, and, and he, was, he was one, of, he was, I think either he or Jonas Mikas, I can't remember. The two of them were the first two that I interviewed. And Jean-Claude was so just generous and supportive and and also just very, uh, the way he framed things, because in, in my childhood, the, the framing around my father's mental illness and his creativity was, was more negative. And Jean-Claude was very, very positive about those same traits. And so sort of through Jean-Claude's eyes, I was able to see my father's creativity in a very different way. And at the end of the interview, you know, when I was saying goodbye to Jean-Claude, I was telling him about the, the only time that I remember meeting my father, which was at a poetry reading in New York. And at that point, my father was pretty um, down on his luck. He had been homeless on and off at that point. And he was pretty much drunk and disheveled at this poetry reading. And I couldn't, you know, understand who the brilliant poet was that my father or that my mother, you know, had fallen in love with when I, you know, met my father many, many years later. And I was telling Jean-Claude about this story and, and Jean-Claude basically gave me a hug and said, you know, your father couldn't be there for you at that time, but he wanted to be and, you know, let me give you a hug and I don't remember exactly what Jean Claude said. It was sort of, it was sort of like, let me give you the hug that your father couldn't give you that moment, or that that you couldn't <laughs> accept at that moment because of who you were seeing in front of you, and and that that wasn't, you know, that wasn't sort of the person who was your father. Is sort of the the what I was left with 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 that interaction with um, Jean Claude, and so that was just. There was there was many moments like that for me in the process of making this film, but that was really a very dear dear moment for me that I didn't capture on camera. So and I don't know even if I did if I would have used it in the film, but for me it was just such a healing a healing moment. And I think because it was one of the first interviews that I did, it did make me feel that it was maybe safe to go on this journey because I think that was the other thing for me is. I didn't know what I was going to run into or who I was going to run into or how they were going to react to me, you know, given who my father was and how difficult he could be or, or I thought he could be. But then I learned people actually didn't feel like he was that difficult. So that was maybe just more my family's, you know, mythology or, or experience with him. So I think that being one of the first interviews really helped, helped me feel secure and confident continuing, you know, with the process and the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you were so young, the information you were receiving was uh, very critical of your father. So it's hard as a child to have a, a positive um, framework 
And then when you met him in New York and he was in down and out and disheveled and all of that. So that footage that you shot where he had set up camp, that was you interviewing him there? No, 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 no. That's that's a whole nother story. So oh, in the 80s, there was an NYU film student who did a documentary about the homeless population in New York, mm -hmm. but she had a very positive outlook on the homeless population. She was very supportive of the homeless. Her film was called Homeless Not Hopeless. And her she had a whole theory about how people become homeless and if it's more of a societal construct that is kind of put on them. And she had met my father and featured my father in her film. And my aunt, who is, you know, one of the archivists of our family history, had a video of the film that the NYU film student had done. And I watched the film and there's only, you know, there's only a small part of the film that features my father, as is the case, right? We know there's a lot more footage on the cutting room floor that doesn't make it into a film. And so when I saw the film, I knew immediately I had to get the B-roll. You know, I had to get mm -hmm. the footage that wasn't in the film because that was going to be really interesting to me because I don't have much film footage of my dad. He was he was the filmmaker, so he didn't turn the camera on himself. He He did have some of his friends who were filmmakers who filmed him. And I was able to track down some of that footage. But in this particular case, I knew if I could get her B-roll and the other you know, pieces of film that she had of my father, that that would just be gold for me. And it took me a few years to track her down, to get the beta tapes digitized. I had to go meet her in San Francisco where she had you know, moved after New York. And I was able to get the the footage digitized and luckily you know she had preserved it because i think it had been about 25 years you know since she had made the film and she had kept her tapes and preserved them and i don't know maybe she just knew that at some point someone was going to want it so mm -hmm. that Absolutely. was really fascinating um also just talking to her you know about her experience and she still had such warm feelings about my father and again uh, just a moment of someone having a, a different experience than maybe what I had heard about growing up. So it was, it was wonderful to also just meet her and talk to her about her experience. And then, you know, she let me use the footage in the film, which again was amazing because there, there isn't that, that much that I was able to find of my father on film. Well, and I also, I um, not silent footage too, like actually yeah. hearing his voice. I'll tell you, I love the footage. It looked like it was super eight footage in the, in the, in the, it, like the loft or the apartment. It was very Andy Warhol, the Ginsburg footage. Great. Um, yeah, no, it was just extraordinary. That, I think that was super eight, but it, there was some great footage, so fantastic archival footage in your film. And it was really at a, an incredible time in, in history in New York city specifically. So yeah, well done. Thank it's really you. quite yeah. an engaging story. Thank you so much for that. Melissa, I'm going to bounce over to you. And my special question for you is, um, okay, you're unmuted, is, um, you know, we're all hearing, you know, we're all, you know, if we're of a certain age, we've watched people kind of go down that path in terms of early signs of Alzheimer's and dementia. And I just, I guess, with your film, I mean, the study's going on and on. And as you said, there's no real conclusion. There's no mm -hmm. end. But what is your big hope? What is the one thing that you really want an audience to take away after watching your film? What is it that you would like? What would you like them to experience? Well, um, yeah, when we embarked on this film, first of all, it was it was even challenging to get funding at first because when you mention Alzheimer's disease, it's just such a downer and we wanted to create a film that has an uplifting ending that ha that makes people just we imagine people dancing joyfully out of the theater but that is impossible to predict so because what we did is follow three families who 
are in this medical study and they're in the medical study because they have Alzheimer's disease in their family. And so we followed the family stories. We followed their experiences in the study. We followed some of the science story. And we really tried to interweave it, but we did not know how these stories were going to end. So there were, there are some very sad moments, of course, but fortunately, fortunately, because of one of the, um, one of the, one of the characters participants had a very happy ending it was, you know, we edited it to, to feel that way. So, and the, n the nice thing is um, the we got, I guess we were really smart or lucky. <laughs> so this, this scientific study is very complicated. It follows genetics. It follows your gut biome. It follows, it, you know, blood pressure and blood sugar and everything you can imagine about a human body and mind. We had to pick something that would be visible, right? Because it's really hard to follow a genetic study. That's like, how do you even show genetics? So, Fortunately, there was a doctor who who initiated a study, Dr. Okonkwo. Um, and, and, and actually, he's from Africa, a wonderful young doctor. He started this sub-study called the uh, physical activity study. So this was visible, right? We could actually show people doing physical activity and like how what impact that has on their, their, their memory and their um, um, amyloid in their brain and that sort of thing. So fortunately, Sigrid, one of the characters, did really hit that hard. She took that very seriously. And the outcome of that is a wonderful, wonderful lesson. Without giving away the whole film, we do want we do want people to know that although there isn't a cure for Alzheimer's disease yet, unfortunately, and in fact, one in nine people in, in the country has dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. That means that Alzheimer's is so bad that they have dementia. And there are other people who have Alzheimer's and don't know it, okay? But one in nine, that could be any of us, okay? It's, it doesn't discriminate against race, against economic success, against, you know, what kind of education you have. It is, we are all in that pool, okay? But there are things you can do, it has been found in this study, to delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And one of those things is exercise. It's, it's healthy living. It's, it's everything your mother should have told you. It's... um you know, good diet, but the exercise, the physical activity seems to be a big thing. And if we can get people after they see the film to like, just do a little more to care for themselves, to delay the onset. Like if you're going to get it, you're going to get it maybe until the cure is found. But if you can delay it by 10 years, that's like not getting it at all. So having a little personal responsibility in this. So that's one big takeaway we, we would like. And there's, there's some others if you want me to go on a little bit. Um, well, I, I have a, another question for you. Sure. And that is, is it, I, I know that it's doesn't, it, it, you know, echo mm -hmm. uh, socioeconomic background and, mm -hmm. and all of that, it, it doesn't matter. Um, it can affect right. anyone. Um, right. But is it, it, so it is delayed or it is, it is remedied or postponed, mm -hmm. but is it because, are the studies showing that it's because we're living longer, that people are living longer and the brain is just at 90, it's, it's tired. I mean, it's an organ, right? Is it, well, is, is it that, or is it diet? Is it, to, is it like, uh, I've heard that it mm -hmm. can be like diabetes of the brain. Right. No, that there's a lot to it. Well, so actually Alzheimer's disease is not normal aging. There are a lot of people who live into their hundreds and don't mm -hmm. have Alzheimer's disease. So, and that would be my other hope that this film will contribute to the more rapid finding of a cure. So more people could just experience normal old age and all the wonderful things that that offers. Okay. I, um, but yeah, there are, yeah, because age is a risk factor. Definitely there's more occurrence because as you get older than the percentage of people who have Alzheimer's disease is higher, if that makes sense. But there, but all those little things you mentioned, diabetes and blood pressure, comorbidities, certain aspects of the physical body. So certain Groups of people do have higher comorbidities. For example, African Americans tend to have a, I think, twice as likely chance of getting Alzheimer's disease because often in the community, just because of socioeconomic factors, I just said it doesn't matter, but it sort of does. Le at lack of access to healthcare early in life, et cetera, um, the odds are higher. You know, so if you, you, we can actually start to prevent Alzheimer's disease starting in childhood in childhood. And we can actually, it exists in people's brains before it's even detectable. That's the other thing. This study really has the people in the study, the guinea pigs are middle-aged women. They're middle, or not only women, they're men too. Mm -hmm. We focus on women because there's a greater odds and 
those are the people who came out for us, you know. Um, so yeah, we, we, we want, we want, we would like actually, and I say we, because we have a team of women, you know, so it's not just me, we have a team and actually it's one of the most authentic filmmaking teams I've worked with. Like the producer, the, the producer thought of the idea, she's a human guinea pig in the study. Her co-producer is 82 years old and very aware of ageist issues. Um, our associate producer is also in the study. Our production assistant had a parent, a father die of Alzheimer's disease. Our impact producer had a parent, a mother and a stepfather die of Alzheimer's disease. And one of the sound people was a nurse in this creative daycare I told you about earlier. So she taught me how to communicate with people with Alzheimer's disease. And I taught her how to do audio, you know, to how to boom and run sound. We kind of cross trained each other. And then when this film came up, she came along for this film. We had another wonderful um, sound person from Dayton, Ohio, who is extremely strong. So we had this very strong, mostly female team of like really intimate experience with Alzheimer's disease. And the people who came out when we did this sort of, sort of a casting, it was really interesting because it's a study, right? Everybody's anonymous. It's a study and they are only identified by their numbers. We couldn't call them up. We couldn't breach that. So Therese Barry Tanner, the producer had to send, she set up this, a letter went out to everybody anonymously who was in the study. And then they volunteered essentially. And then we did some filming. They did some pre-calling, like we filmed and then we kind of narrowed it down to the three families, but we couldn't, you know, that we had to respect like all the IRB issues of this study. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the three families, they happen to be women. The lead, the lead people happen to be women. So it's a very female very power so. film. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very femme-centric. Yeah. 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 And we want women to feel strong afterwards, to feel like you can do something about this. Like, just take care of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Number one. Or yeah, number two, see. join a study. You know, like, let's solve this problem as quickly as we solved COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get out there and... Did we solve it? I hope so. Well, Do tell. Right. Oh, yeah, we're getting there. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And the third thing I should quickly mention is stigma. We want the film to really erase the stigma of having Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease, once again, look at there are six of us now on this call. One of us, the odds are, is, you know, probably going to get it. Oh, no. Uh, it's us. It's <laughs> us. It's not someone else. You know, so it, um, no, it's just a fact of life. So we need to understand that people with Alzheimer's disease are family, their parents, their grandparents, they're us, their friends. And this even affects the next generation. Mm -hmm. As you can see in the story of Karen and her son, Xavier, just by the fighting for resources, you know? So stigma, if we can get rid of stigma and take care of people with love and humanity in a, in a dementia friendly world, that will that would be a contribution. Wouldn't it be? That yeah. was a big takeaway I had from your film. That was the big, big hope I had. Rather than putting people in locked floors, institutionalizing people that have lived these extraordinary lives in many cases, and all of a sudden they lose um, capacity. And in North America, you know, where we tend to, in civilized society, we tend to institutionalize our seniors. In other cultures, they're embraced in the community and they don't have to leave the village, so to speak. So well done. Strong oh, messages you. in your documentary. Thank you so much for that. I'm not forgotten, Catherine or Megan. I'm going to bounce over to Megan because you're popping in and out of screen. I'm afraid I'm going to lose you again. What's going on, girl? Let's unmute you, shall we? Here we go. Unmuting. Where's your son? Is he still in the house? Oh, I think you muted yourself. I don't know where my team. I just want to say what's going on. I apologize for jumping no, up no, and no, down. No, 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 I thought maybe. But I've been no, avoiding no. Alzheimer's. I've been out hiking in the bush, and I've only just got back. Just and now, that's where you went. Complete chaos. That's I didn't think I could just... make this talk. <laughs> but the surly teenager has taken. I'm on my iPhone. On my cell phone he's taken the charger so any minute now oh, i might no. go off air so i've been running off trying to find it oh no <laughs> so apologies here um, bring him here we're gonna talk to him we're, we oh he's mother. stopped off to school now <laughs> <laughs> well we don't want to lose you so we're gonna i'm glad i jumped over to you so I think okay I, well if i disappear again i'm trying to find a charger okay and you could you're gonna come back because we're here until 4 30 so um I had a couple of questions for you, but one, 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 one thing, I mean, I'm, I've never been to New Zealand. I would love to go. I was mentored by Gaylene Preston. 
Oh. I believe she's, yeah, she was one of my yeah, mentors yeah. at Women she's... in the Director's Chair many years ago. Oh, yeah, she's the matriarch. Yes, yeah, she's lovely. <laughs> Um, and I, I just wanted to ask, what, where is New Zealand now in terms of women, women's rights? Is, is the feminist movement vital and strong and still fighting for, for equity in the, it not, I'm not talking about the they film are. industry, I'm they just are. talking, they are. Mm -hmm. They are, and um, I think New Zealand's doing very well compared to a lot of countries in the world in terms of, closing the gender pay gap in terms of legislating for um, a fairer deal for women. But I think uh, a lot of ground was gained in the 80s. And I think that's what I realised making this film, that um, we sort of gained a lot in that time, huge surge forward. And then after that, like I think in a lot of Western countries, um, the feminist became the dirty F word. And, you know, mm -hmm. I have a friend who worked for a big international corporation who said educated women would come in for jobs and they'd say, don't worry, I'm not a feminist. So I think the kind of the, the fury and the extremism of some of these 80s women was part of that backlash, which we've all heard about. And I think we've lost a bit of ground in some areas. So I think the framework is there for everything to be, you know, the legislation is there, but the culture hasn't shifted enough. And I think part of that is because we've all let the ground slip a little bit from yeah. the 80s and the ferocity which which we fought for equal rights for, you know, we wouldn't take any shit in the 80s, nothing. Yeah. And women, young women today I see doing that. You know, it's different different problems. Different um, problems, different platforms yeah. for for expressing um, I think the word, the feminist, the F word has certainly lost. I've actually heard women say, recently actually, I've heard women say, I'm not a feminist. Well, do they know what feminism means or feminist means equality? I mean, really, yeah. if you look at the Webster Dictionary, that is the definition of feminism. So I don't know what it, why there's a backlash, but I think there is. But we're going to discuss this at the director's round table. It's one of the questions I have on the 28th, and I think we should, we should bring it back up. Um, but that's great to know that New Zealand's really at the, at the fore of, of it, it, it is in, in ways equity. that can be legislated in terms of sexual violence. It's probably just as bad as it ever was. Oh. We have terrible rates of domestic violence as well. They're big um, problems here. Oh, oh, oh. Do you have shelters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's all there. But New Zealand generally is, you know, there's a lot There's a lot of good things about New Zealand, but there is a lot of violence in New Zealand. There is a lot of violence in our culture. I think it's probably disproportionate to other Western cultures. And that is seen in violence against women. I see. I wasn't mm. aware of that, actually. Mm. Shame. Yeah. But, yes, you know, it's prevalent everywhere. I mean, they're saying that with COVID, there's an increase in domestic violence across the world. I mean, you know, the UK is really suffering for it. And they didn't have a lot in place um, to, to respond to that. Um, but I think part of it is that the laws have to change and that um, offenders need to be punished more severely, not just be taken away for the night and incarcerated and then they're released the next day on their own recognizance. But that's a whole other conversation. There's a lot of issues systemically in, in how the penal systems respond to violence against women and children. Still, yeah, the penalties here are really, they're decent. But I think um, one of the problems is that the, the ramifications of being charged with rape, and I'm not making an excuse for rape, the penalties are so high that there isn't any room for a conversation in the middle. So at the moment now they're trialing um, new ways of dealing with sexual violence in the courts in New Zealand. And one is to have what's, it's like a family group conference where the victims and the perpetrators can sit down and discuss what happened and come to their own agreements about what the, what the consequences might be. You know, in some cases, oh. maybe the victim only wants an acknowledgement and an apology. They don't want to see the perpetrator go to jail for 20 years or whatever oh. it might be. But as soon as you raise the specter of rape, the consequences and what's at stake is so extreme that any any perpetrator coming into that conversation 
is going to get leggled up and not want to participate. So there's no room to it's, talk it's, about the nuances of rape, any grey areas. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an impossible situation. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know, but it seems very extreme to have a, a victim in a room with the person that raped them. They don't necessarily have to be. They can have people representing them. Oh, okay. I mean, I think, I think New Zealand has been quite progressive in this, and they're trying all sorts of ways to minimise Mm. the re-victimization of women oh, when it comes good. to sexual violence charges. So they don't have to be there. They can have a whole whanau or family support with them. They don't, you know, they can have representatives in that room, but it is a more personalized negotiation about how to deal with something that's happened. Maybe they should bring going the six, through a whole criminal court case. Maybe they should bring the six angry women in to, to, to have a chat and they should be, <laughs> should be part of the committee. Um, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Catherine, hello. I'm going looking for a charger. Yes. Okay, you do that. And I'm going to mute you just in case the boy comes back. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. So I have a question for you. And that is um, because of the subjects in your document, sisters and all, What what was the most... What was the most challenging aspect of making this documentary? And how long did it take you? How many years did it take you to get to your final cut, to arrive at your final cut? And what were the biggest challenges? Mm -hmm. Well, time and money are always big challenges. And one of the price to pay for um, being an independent filmmaker is like you have to put a lot of time and uh, sacrifice and also like do a lot of uh, things that you wouldn't expect to have to do. So I would say that one of the challenge was definitely like doing my own camera work and sound work for most of the film uh, while I was directing. So it just, it was hard to keep perspective on the bigger story. And, uh, and also it was just like hard to keep um, the technical quality uh, and to sustain it, you know, for uh, so luckily, like uh, I shot a lot of footage and, you know, I also edited the film. So I, I edited out whatever was not, you know, at its best. But of course, when you're doing like so many things and wearing like so many hats, like you cannot be at your best at everything. So that was definitely a, a challenge. Um, uh, that being said, like I had support, you know, my producer Isabel and also with the animation and the music and the sound, but just like the production was uh, most of the time by myself. And in Iceland also, it was uh, very challenging because of the nature and um, just the light was so bright and omnipresent and the wind and there were no trees and a lot of like people in movement. So in Montreal, I was filming more in intimate settings, but then in Iceland, I had like five or six people to follow sometimes. And uh, so it was just uh, yeah, hard to carry the, the equipment. It was heavy <laughs> and wow. the, the nature was very raw. Um, and then I'd say the, uh, the other challenge was time. At first, like he, well, you asked the question when I started filming, it started in 2012. So first it took a while to just get funding and it was hard to explain to people exactly what I wanted to do with the film and what the animations were gonna look like. Um, and so it took about like two and a half years, I think, to get funding, but then the production also kind of got delayed like I was expecting to go to Iceland much earlier but then it took longer and in the end like I guess it was a blessing because in the meantime like I got a lot of the archives I was talking about earlier so it just allowed me to really like unfold the story and you know like just work on those little find those little gems along the way mm -hmm. and um and then also I had the pregnancy, pregnancy leave uh, at one point and I was in the middle of editing. <laughs> so I was like trying to finish the film before, but then 
it uh, it didn't happen as I expected. So then I had when I was talking about time is like the time to actually work on my project and just my workflow was very broken because I was working on my film like three afternoons a week and then you know I had to pause so I had to just do a lot of thinking in between uh steps of you know every session of work like I had to do a lot of thinking which was also maybe a blessing in its own way so you know I'm trying to see it like a very positive thing now and I, I guess being a mother also just gave me a totally new perspective and just you know not working on my film for like a few months uh, but then yeah like when I got back to it uh, it was again the challenge of time just when it got accepted to premiere then I I had to finish it in three months. So after like all of those years, <laughs> then suddenly I had to really uh, put it all together. And uh, and I can say that in the end, like I'm really happy with the film and, you know, I managed to do something, like do the film I wanted to do in the first place. But it's just, you never know when it's gonna be over. And it's until you see it and you shape it, it's really when it, becomes real and alive um so uh, yeah also like the editing by myself just was uh, another challenge of like keeping the perspective on my film you know and not being like too close to it mm -hmm. that's the thing about documentary that's different from scripted in that obviously you know a lot of people say well the story comes together in the in post-production it comes together in the edit i think from watching all your films, you all had a very clear uh, perspective. You you knew what you the story you wanted to tell, and you told it. Um, but since we're on that track, I want to just check the time. But I have a, a last question, my personally for each of you, and it's along the lines of how long did it take you to to complete your film for release? Um, and if you want to speak to some of the challenges, you can. Um, but it's not unusual for a documentary feature to take anywhere from five years to ten years to finish a film. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting journey and I, I commend all of you because it takes uh, tenacity and resilience and they're not easily funded anywhere in any country. Um, a lot of it is blood, sweat and tears and it's clearly all of you driven by the director you wore many hats in your production all of you so i want to ask if anyone in the back room or whatever you want to call it where is everybody um i'm going to exit the full screen because i want to see something oh that didn't do it okay if someone uh are there any questions from the, i just want to get a sense if there's any questions for the panelists before I proceed with another question. Are there any questions and how would I know what they are? Are they, are they coming in from um, YouTube? Someone in the chat can let me know. But while we're waiting for a response from the people in the back room, I'd like to know how long it took you to make your film and possibly um, what what were uh, what were some of the challenges, or what was the biggest challenge for you? Let's go over to Caroline. Um, for this particular movie, I had the chance um, to have um, a, rap, a very quick production. Uh, it took me a year and a half, which is which is rapid. That's good. A much more time and, well yeah yeah and 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 it was also because um, um, the production uh, was made with uh, the help of of the cinematheque in Belgium and it's part of a collection which is seen as d'aujourd'hui so it helps a lot to to finance the film and I think my um, my biggest challenges was to uh, uh, find a path in all, all all of the Marion's work because which more 
with, with more than a thousand things, there is a lot of things to talk about. So I didn't want to talk about everything because you stay in the surface. So I have to find a way and to be to 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 make sure that it would be interesting for those who who know her work, but those the youngest one who doesn't know at all. So and 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 also because Marion um, gave me um, all uh, uh, confidence to to what I want. So she she really uh, accept all my proposal unconditionally. Mm -hmm. So it was important for me that she recognize herself in the movie, and she did so. That clearly. Was <laughs> it, it's very much your film is very much this um, beautiful, intimate artist portrait. It's a portrait of a of an artist, a great artist, and you could feel watching your film that there was this trust. She just let you be with her in such a beautiful way. Um, yes, so the, it the trust was really important. I mean, mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> course because you when you you make such a documentary you make with the person not against the person mm -hmm. and it's very important to have the trust it's mm -hmm. not just to yeah do the or, or such. yeah you really felt you feel that watching the film you really do feel it and and uh and beyond the clouds is a screening at tithba lightbox next Friday the 26th from 9 a.m. through to the 29th. So all the films um, that are on that platform are streaming uh, until the end of the weekend. Uh, so just so people know that it's available from the 26th to the 29th. Um, I'll go over to Therese. So Therese, over to you. Sure. Hello. Yep. Well, I just wanted to say I totally related to everything that Catherine was talking about in terms of, you know, juggling motherhood and possibly other jobs and other life things while you're also trying to finish your passion project. So I was I was just relating to, to all of that. So I guess ditto on a lot of what she was saying. And I think, you know, for me, I was trying to remember the exact um, date that the exhibition was that I was telling you about earlier that Jonas Mikas um, instigated for his 90th birthday. And I believe it was, um, 2014. So I, I had already been doing research and work, you know, starting about 2013. So, you know, seven, eight ish years, I guess mm -hmm. I would say is, is how long my journey took. And for me, th there was, it, I think I elongated it a little bit, honestly, because working on this film was a very personal project for me. And for a while, I didn't know if I wanted to finish it because it was such a treasure hunt and it gave me an excuse to talk to people that I might not have made a huge effort um, to talk to. The fact that I was interviewing them for a film made me you know, make more of an effort to meet them as opposed to, oh, you knew my father, I'd love to have coffee with you and chat. You know, that's a very, mm -hmm. two very, very different approaches and ways to you know talk to people in the world and so the fact that i was working on a film i think made me uh do that a little bit stronger than i normally would have and so for a while i just sort of felt like well i don't want to stop like you know there's all these things happening and all these people to talk to and uh but then there started to be kind of a natural uh you know denouement of the of the film and the process for me because as you see towards the end of the film, there was an exhibition of the Velvet Underground that featured mm. my father. And that sort of felt like a culmination of my process as far as all the trips to Europe that I had made and all the various people that I had interviewed, but also sort of somewhat of a culmination for my father to finally be recognized for the influence that, that he had you know, on the underground culture of that time and to be recognized as one of um, sort of the beginners of that underground culture, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Velvet Underground, I think oh, yeah. really was a was a nice sort of summation 
and a nice place to kind of end the the process and the journey for me. Um, but, you know, I would say for me, it's continuing. There's, you know, renewed interest in my father's work and, um, you know, books that of poetry that want to get published. And there's another exhibition in Paris that um, one of the uh, gallery owners who is featured in the film has been wanting to do in Paris. So maybe that will happen at some point. You know, there's there's still lots of things in process as it relates to my father's legacy. And I think for me also just learning more about that and people's interest in his work. So the film maybe might be complete, but I don't necessarily feel like that whole process has been you know, completed for me. And I also would like to show this film in theaters and not necessarily do a, a typical theatrical release, but do more sort of art houses or um, coffee houses, you know, sort of a nod to the, the beat poet legacy of meeting in coffee houses and talking in coffee houses and yeah. sort of doing something a little non-traditional and then also multimedia. I'd like to exhibit some of my father's work in conjunction with seeing the film and maybe even show his films. So there could be a more multimedia. Oh, that's experience. fabulous. Yeah, for sure you could do that. You could show his work, show your documentary. If they do the, the thing in, Lund in uh, France, they could show your documentary as well. There's so many opportunities. To, and, to and my sister, Wynn, who um, I interview in the film, she had a whole theatrical production, which you see a few snippets of, but mm -hmm. it played like 14 times, I think, in Amsterdam, which is where she lives. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to get even bigger, you know, she could re, you know, redo her theatrical um, presentation. So there, there can be many, many layers. Oh yeah, I'm sure you're gonna have a long, um, I'm just getting so many text messages. I don't know what's going on over there. Um, but I, I'm sure you're going to have all these films are going to have a long shelf life. They're not going anywhere fast. I don't think so. So thank you for that. Um, Megan, how long did it take you to make your film? And what was the other part of the question? I can't remember. What were your the biggest challenges? Um, my film took about two years to make. And I probably could have just kept going. <laughs> so I understand what Therese is saying as well. Someone did say to me that a film is never complete. It's just never finished. And you never reach that perfect conclusion. I think with mine, I probably dragged it out a bit longer than necessary. Or not longer than necessary. I dragged it out for a bit because I really, really hoped that at some stage, one of the six women would come to me, even anonymously, and say here's what happened and give the blow by blow account. That was what I felt like we had promised we would find and we never did. So it felt like I'd failed. It felt like an epic fail. And it wasn't really until we sort of got quite far down the track that I realized that actually that wasn't as important as I thought it was. And it wasn't again until we got into the edit suite that actually I thought, I feel satisfied anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was like a treasure hunt for me too, Therese. And <laughs> it was like, any minute now I'm going to get them. Any minute now we just got to hold off a bit longer. <laughs> um, but I'm sure that they're aware that it was being made. And I'm sure that I spoke to a couple of them, but I was never going to get what I hoped I would get. But in some ways, I'm kind of happy that it's still a bit of a mystery and it forced me to think a bit more creatively, I think, in terms of how I was going to paint a picture of that time and the world that they came from without mm -hmm. hearing them directly account for their actions. So mm -hmm. it was a different challenge from what I thought. I just think it's incredible that nobody got charged for anything, like the assault on the gentleman or the... You know, oh, like, I, I they, think that the police at the time didn't take it seriously, but... One of the other things that we were up against was that um, actually the charges against the women are still open. The case has never been closed. So they could, what? if they had come forward, be charged with kidnapping. And I guess that any any fear of that probably kept them pretty Wow, cautious. that's something. <laughs> Jeez, it's yeah. still open. That's incredible. All right. Yeah. Well, I think there's a part two to your documentary. 
Um, <laughs> oh, no, I got to the end and went, never again. No, never no. again. I know. We all say that after a documentary. <laughs> I think going we do. <laughs> back, going back to scripted. All right. Catherine, how long did it take you to make your film? And what were the, what were the biggest challenges? And I do have a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know where they came from, but I guess somewhere. A YouTube or StreamYard. Um, yes. Well, I started in 2012 and finished in 2019. I think wow. I kind of addressed the main challenges, uh, but maybe yes. I can add that, uh, like we were for the animations, it took about two years and it unfolded. Uh, maybe it took longer than I expected to uh, to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with uh, four compositors and uh, Jaysa, one of the main subject of the film, one of the two sisters, she did the, the illustrations and some of the animations um, in camera. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, definitely like uh, one of the big challenge, but everything was uh, like edited with uh, the sound uh, like the the storytelling of each of the scenes and placed in the edit and then um i kind of storyboarded with the uh, live action footage i had myself i had film uh either in iceland or uh, elsewhere but it was uh, really the idea that uh, it's like um kids book you know everything is kind of oversized and it's like uh, the imagination and the playfulness of two sisters imagining their uh, the home country of their great grandmother and their, their cultural heritage so that was like the premise but also uh, i wanted like to revisit everything once we're in iceland so for instance like the waterfall in the animation we actually revisit it later and it's actually part of a scene and same thing with the volcano and same thing with the island Vesmenaier. so like everything that you see in the, uh, the animation at the beginning of the film is actually like coming back in real life later so that was also like something i wanted to play with like the kind of expectations um and the feeling of uh having seen that before, but it's like completely different. And I guess what I want people like to take away from it, like I really enjoyed like working on the intergenerational transmission and how like all of the women from different generations are interpreting their, you know, art and cultural heritage differently and how it uh, it's shown at the different places and differently for each one of them. Um, and it's, like it's been uh, talked about by some of uh, the other filmmakers today, but it's really about like woman empowerment and um, like just, you know, to accept who you are, the way you are, like uh, the sisters share about uh, just feeling outsiders when they were younger because of their name or their look or just, you know, their, what they were doing. And um, uh, Jace also talks about like feeling uh, being more uh, like a bigger size than normal, like th than the, the usual. So, but it it brought them to like sh she became to sue and to make uh, costumes because of that, and just to remind remind ourselves that all of our singularities actually are what makes us unique. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, so it, the film also is a little bit about that. It's like I talked about the difficulties and, you know, what it means to like do everything kind of not perfectly, but then it really gives that look and it really gives that sense of the entire film. And I, I wonder what that film would have looked like if, you know, it was a, would have been made differently, like, um, Mm -hmm. so I, I think it's like just embracing all of your flaws in one way and, you know, just make them mm -hmm. as beautiful as you can with what you have. And it's really the will. Um, and also, yeah, about like that uh, transmission, just like talk to your parents and talk to your grandparents, like they have stories to tell. And um, and for me, it was like a real discovery. It's a, it's a search about identity, about just who we are and um, and it's I, I find it's important to uh, to share that and to keep the traditions alive and current. And you could see the transmission in terms of the creativity from the grandmother to the to the granddaughters. That was mm -hmm. so 
prevalent throughout your film, that whole transmission, that whole the intergenerational, that gene, that special gene. I love the designer as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And the mother too, which is also an artist. So it's oh, a, yeah, like the, the four women from different generations, but yes, all yeah. like having this really strong will to express themselves mm -hmm. in different Beautiful. ways. I'm going to put the same question to Melissa, but if we want to answer a couple of the uh, questions on the chat, if you can keep it brief, we have 423 and we are finished at 430. I don't know if this is programmed to go off on us. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then we'll take this question from the uh, chat. So how long did it take you to make your documentary, Melissa? Okay, well, be, from the time Therese thought of the idea until now, which this is an important part of the filmmaking is just to screen the movie and talk about it. It's been 10 years. So, okay. but we filmed for five years. We filmed okay. for five wow. and, and, and edited for an additional two. Although the editing was ongoing. That was the hardest part was the, were those last two years of editing. But it was, you know, so we followed a longitudinal study. And I would say that the film is longitudinal. We followed three families over five years. Okay. So, and so time is almost a character because you see yeah. things change and seasons yeah. change and people, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. The biggest challenge, as I said, were those two years. I think that the, there was a very, it was very difficult to put these immersive observational family stories and mix them in with the science. So the science wasn't as observational. The science was a little more interview based, right? And it was extremely hard to mesh those two styles together and have it feel natural. So fortunately we we were we were lucky. We we test screened it many times and we got to hear when people laughed and they told us when they were bored or if there was too much science and we had some wonderful consulting editors. Jim Klein, um, Jamie Schlank, Maggie Bowman was a one was wonderful. And Gordon Quinn, at the very end, Gordon Quinn, one of the makers of Hoop Dreams at Cartem Quinn Films, he was a consulting editor. So it was really interesting how oh, wow. so much of our process was we took things out. We took the science out. A lot of it was removing the science and, you know, really following more of the family stories, which were more natural. The, so the scientists didn't quite let us into their homes. You know, we right. would have liked that, but, you know, that would have. So, you know, you get more immersed into, like, personal stuff, right? So we took it out, took it out. And then finally, we had a test screening at Cartemquin and then we spent like a whole year working on those notes. And then we came back to Gordon Quinn and he said, not enough science. There's just not, you know, <laughs> there's not enough science because he's a real science buff. So then, but that was really perceptive. So we really figured out where, you know, like what was like actually missing in the thought process to just put just the right amount in so people could follow. Right. I like the MRI jazz that was going on. I'm getting buzzed or beeped okay. or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. The question we have that's on the screen that I can see is, um, okay, so if you were to do one thing differently in the making of your film, what would it be? The one thing that you might do differently. I like that none of you would do anything differently. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> it's exactly the way it should be. Uh, Anything on your bucket list? Anything that you wish there was the one thing that you thought or wished or maybe thought you wish you had, but you didn't get it? The one interview? Uh, or the... I, I, I wish they had found a cure for Alzheimer's disease on camera. That would okay. have been interesting, yes. Fair enough. <laughs> Anyone else? I would I say... wish I'd found the women. <laughs> oh, yes. The women. And for me, unfortunately, there was a couple of people who passed while I was making the film and I didn't get a chance to meet them in person. I had corresponded with them and hoped to get them on camera and I just wasn't fast enough to do that. So there was, there was unfortunately a few people that I, I didn't get to, to interview. Um, okay. Caroline, anything that you wish you had, that you wish you had or you would do differently? No, I wish Mario would still be there. Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> Sorry. We all wish that. Yes, of course. Did she see any of the film? Did she see any of the film? She saw the film. She liked it very much. She, mm -hmm. she, she, saw, she saw it four times, I think. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I'm so happy she saw yeah, it. She love it. Any other, uh, Catherine, anything from you? 
Well, I think uh, I really uh, managed to do the film I wanted to do. I filmed with uh, uh, Tiran Jesa's sibling. They have a, another sister, ah. uh, which decided not to be part of the film. Um, and I, I respected her choice and um, and I tried to do the best without her. Um, and I think, you know, it, I really focused on the positive and what I had instead of like thinking that I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, she's part of the family, but she's not on camera with us uh, in the film. Mm -hmm. Well, we saw her in some archival footage. Yes. I think we saw her, all the three sisters, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I have been recording this just so everyone knows, uh, which wasn't really the plan, but I'm really glad I did it. I'm just going to have to get a consent from all of you um, because there may have been, uh, I'm letting you know, there may have been a technical glitch with the straight streaming to YouTube. I'm not sure what happened there. We, it was all set up. Um, and that's where we directed the audience that that you know the the link that you received to saying go here or if you want to share tell people to go there but the good news is i recorded this being the smart cookie that i am so um this will go to uh our editor or one of our editors and that we will stream this on our youtube uh playlist for uh the uh, duration of the film festival so we'll have it on the playlist it will be there we'll share the link with you um if it's not going to be the same link is there anything else you'd like to say where your film is going to be next whether your distribution your film you have a distributor for your film or festival any more online or hopefully physical festival what is going on with you uh, Therese, what's happening with your film next? Well, that's a very good question. As I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping to do some either art house cinemas or universities or sort of non-traditional uh, theaters or places to, to see the film and do some multimedia exhibitions in conjunction with the film. Since we don't know really when things are going to be opening up, I haven't mm -hmm. um, been able to kind of secure those locations yet, but I've been talking to various um, entities that have space and, you know, we'll, we'll see once, once we're able to kind of plan stuff and schedule stuff, I guess I'm hoping to be able to see some of you in person to, to see the film and, and see some of Piero Hillicher's work. So I guess I would direct people to go to my website to stay informed because I don't have anything to release right now. And now, Therese, you're still on Encore Plus. Your film is still there until the end of the month, correct? I Very good. I couldn't remember if it was the end of the month or the end of this weekend. I couldn't remember which it was. <laughs> I think I, I do remember. I'm pretty sure we indicated that you were you were going to be on Encore Plus uh, until the end of until the end of the festival. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. So anyone go. wants to see your film, they can go there and see your film there. Uh, Caroline, your film screening uh, premiering on um, the 26th of March, and it will be on Digital Tiff Bell Lightbox until the 29th. Megan, your film is screening on Encore Plus until the end of the end of the month, until the 28th. Is that correct on Encore Plus? Yes. Absolutely. Your film is is on. It's on Encore Plus. Yes. Mm -hmm until the 28th. Catherine, I think your film ended on the 21st, correct? Uh, I think it's until tonight on Encore Plus. Oh, yes, yes, today is Sunday. Yes, 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 I keep thinking yeah. it's Monday. So please, if you and want, please go there and see the film uh, Sisters Dream and Variations. It's on Encore Plus uh, today is the last day, mm -hmm. I think, yes? Yeah, and uh -huh. then I think it plays until after for another couple of days on the Cinema Moderne's website because uh, we had like a physical release last fall, but then when the cinema is closed then we postponed the release um, online. So we have like a few days left and then there's a festival in uh, BC, the Real to Real uh, Film Festival for Youth uh, in April. Um, happening, yeah. And I think that's it for our, oh, it's like spotlight on 
Quebec filmmakers uh, on the Hot Dogs platform as well. Oh, congratulations. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, Melissa, your film is screening at TIFF, D Digital TIFF Bell Lightbox, also opening on the 26th, and it will be available until the 29th. Just so you know, you can buy a ticket or get a ticket, not you, you all get VIP passes, but uh, people who are watching or will be watching, um, you know, you have uh, 48 hours from the time you buy your ticket and 24 hours from the time you push play on Digital Tiff Bell Lightbox to watch the film. So Great. it was so wonderful having all of you. And oh, Melissa, perhaps yeah. you have something to add. About well, yes, I was going to share, you asked about dis a distributor. Yes, I, yes, I yes. wanted to share, yes, our film has a wonderful distributor from Quebec, Lizanne Rouillard from Film Option International. So mm. she, we're just getting started. She's a wonderful person. She fully understands the film. She really gets it. She's a one of us, um, same demographic and same goals. And uh, so she's going to be looking for a broadcast home. And, and meanwhile, we're going to, we have a few other film festivals, including the Raw Science Film Festival and Doc Utah, plus That's this, great. we're thrilled to be a part of this, but we're going to do impact screenings until we find a broadcast home. And that is, you know, in communities, showing in, showing it to communities and having discussions and trying to hopefully motivate people to make to change. change. Yeah, to make change. I Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to speak with you after the festival. I have some ideas about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here in Canada, here in, in Ontario. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a wonderful panel. I'm looking forward to perhaps meeting you physically live at some point in the near or distant future. Uh, and um, I hope that you will all keep in touch. You have each other's emails and hopefully you'll see each other's films. And if not, because we're in this digital platform, uh, there is rumblings about sharing links with other filmmakers for a short period of time post, uh, post festival. So you can see each other's films because of course we're not here together in the theater watching each other's films. So I want to thank you very much for joining me today. Female Eye Film Festival. Thank always you. honest, not always pretty. <laughs> thank you, Leslie Ann. Thank you. We'll see you. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I don't know how to turn this thank off. You. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Okay, everybody, where's my team? Team, team. <laughs>